Folks at home, welcome back to the Crimson Oak Pond, and if you're new to this series, we built this five acre pond over the past year, and it took us several months to get all of the dirt excavated, and we had to bring in several truckloads of clay, and we also built an island, a dock, and got all the structure in place, and then it took a couple of months to get it full of water. After that, we stocked it with a bunch of bait fish, including bluegills and threadfin shad, and not long after that, we stocked it with these little two inch aggressive bass. And we're going to be giving you an update on them here in just a minute and showing you how big they've gotten. But before we get into that, let's get an update on the wildlife. Because even though we're heading into fall, it feels more like spring is in the air. Because we've had several new additions to the Crimson Oak Farm. And one of the bobcats also had twin babies. And the little baby raccoons are always having a good time and being a menace to the mama raccoon. And this warmer weather has the tiger bass on an absolute tear. When the bluegill feeders go off, you'll be seeing fireworks as they're chasing their next meal. And if you missed the last video, we had a really close encounter with an osprey. I just so happened to be flying a drone whenever an osprey stopped by the pond and snagged one of our fish. And I got some really cool footage tailing it around and even followed it back to its perch. And let's just say that's not the last time we'll be seeing the osprey. He made a return to the pond and we'll be seeing it here in just a minute. But now let's take a look at one of my favorite new things to film with this drone, and that's feeding time for the bass and bluegills. So all the fish are cordial until the feeders go off. And after that, it's a blitz for about 10 to 20 seconds and absolute mayhem. So the smaller fish are bluegills and tilapia that are coming up to eat the protein pellets. And the bigger fish that are darting in circles are obviously the tiger bass. And the interesting thing is, they're finally big enough to start eating the bluegills and tilapia. So we've noticed that three times a day when the feeders go off, that is their food of choice. But what's also interesting is that they kind of shift their appetite later at night. As the green lights come on, rather than chasing those bluegills around at night, they go for the threadfin shad and other smaller bait fish. But my best guess for this is, as the sun's out, these water temps are getting really high, and their metabolism is high as well, so they need that bigger meal with those bluegills and tilapias. But man, I love watching it from this angle. Because this area is relatively shallow, so you can see those abundance of fish that come up and rely on these feeders each day. But now that we've had a good look from overhead, it's time to dive underneath the water and take a look from that perspective. So we've had several people comment and say we should use underwater drones, well, I've got an idea that may be a little bit better than that. So probably everyone watching this video is familiar with a GoPro camera. Well, there's a new camera out called an Insta360. And the overall package is relatively similar to the GoPro. But the coolest feature about this is the camera portion actually pops out of the housing, making it probably one of the smallest and lightest 4K cameras out there. And one cool feature about this camera is you can still watch what's being recorded from the screen on the housing. So you guys probably already see where I'm heading with this. I wanna to try to strap one of these tiny cameras on one of the tiger bass and get a first person view of what it looks like down there beneath the water. All right, time to catch a bass and film him underwater. So I got this rigged up with the Velcro strap and the camera tied to a fishing line so we can retrieve it, reel it back in. I'm also gonna scan it to see if it's a fish that we've caught and tagged before. We're looking for a little bass submarine to go swimming around in the pond for us. Got him right at the oak throne. <laughs> All right. Let's see if he's been tagged. He has. This fish is five six nine six three eight. So the first fish we're going to be working with today is named Bertha, and it's the third time we've caught this bass on a variety of different lures. <laughs> and strapping a camera to a bass probably would have been easier with a second person. But the main thing I wanted to do is make sure its fins were free to move, so it didn't affect Bertha swimming at all. So we got everything rigged up. Let's take a dive underwater. And the first thing I noticed is we got a nice algae bloom in the water, which is perfect. But Bertha was pretty slow moving at first. As you'll see here, she basically just went down to the bottom and sat near a brush pile, probably trying to recover from being caught. But a few minutes later, the journey around the pond began and she stayed in the shallower parts of the pond at first in that four to five foot depths. And you'll start seeing some of the bait fish that were in this area. And I'm not 100% sure where she was at this spot, but check out all the tiny bluegills. And it looks like we got a few tilapia swimming by. I think these were the original ones that we stocked a few months back. They don't look small enough to be offspring. 
That's another really positive sign of a tiny largemouth bass that would have just been born this past spring. So that was the last shot from Bertha. I didn't want to put too much stress on her, so we caught a second bass from right near the oak throne. And the interesting thing was the bass swam right back to the oak throne after we released it. And more shots of what the oak throne looks like underwater. And then this fish started swimming out to some of those deeper brush piles in that six to eight foot depth range. Got a pretty big fish that swam off down there at the bottom near that piling. There's some old pallets and cinder blocks we put in for structure before we added the water. So overall, I'm pretty impressed with the clarity of the water and the different types of things we were able to see. I just tried the test out on two different bass because I didn't want to put too much stress on them. And I was also a little bit worried that if they got down there in those deep brush piles that they could potentially get stuck and I wouldn't be able to retrieve the camera. But I thought it was a pretty interesting perspective. And now that we got the camera and everything set up, if this is something you guys would like to see more of, leave a comment down below. And today's cookout is brought to you by HelloFresh. And if you live out in a remote location like our farm, it's a perfect fit because they provide all the meat, vegetables, and ingredients for a full cooked meal directly to your doorstep. And it's very simple. You just hop on their website, pick a few meals out, and they have over 40 options each week. And for this week, I chose steak tacos, parmesan crusted trout, and bourbon steak with chive butter. And the thing I really love about HelloFresh is they provide a cheat sheet for each meal. So one side's going to have all the ingredients that are included, but if you flip it over on the back, you'll see all the pots and pans and cookware you need to bust out. And then it gives you step-by-step -step instructions with pictures included that make it really easy to learn new recipes. So today we're going to try out the backyard bourbon steak. And you get started by chopping up all the vegetables. And you also chop up a piece of kielbasa bread. I think I pronounced that right. But I told Liz that was a new one for me. I feel like we're basically making croutons to go into this dish. But you get the vegetables coated in olive oil and salt and pepper and get them started cooking on the stove top. And at the same time, we're getting a cast iron skillet hot and cooking the steaks for about five minutes on each side. And after the vegetables are done, we're getting everything mixed together, including the special sauce. And as always, I'm very impressed with the high quality ingredients and walking through each step of the recipe was extremely easy. So I'm a big fan of HelloFresh and if any of you are interested in trying them out, you can click the link in the video description or go to HelloFresh.com and use code POG Bass SEP 50 for 50% 50 off plus free shipping. And you can customize these meals based on your needs and also save time and money by not having to go to the grocery store. And each meal takes 30 minutes or less to cook it's going to be tough to beat that, folks. So now that we've seen the underwater fish's view, let's get that bird's eye view of the pond. And we've got the drone up in the air, and I'm tailing an osprey around to see exactly what it is they see as they're out here hunting for fish in the pond. And in our last video, that's the first time I've seen one of the ospreys catch one of these bigger bass. So the first thing I did after I saw that was fertilize the pond so that algae bloom will help stain the water and make it harder for the osprey to catch the bass. But there was our first close call. Looks like the Osprey aborted at the last second. And we got another dive bomb coming up. Looks like that was a clean swing and a miss. And the water clarity's still not where I want it. You can still see down to the bottom in some of these shallow areas. But I definitely think it's helping. Because there's another attack where the Osprey came up empty handed. So the fertilizer definitely helped out, as today the osprey flew away without any of our fish. But speaking of fish eating birds, we got Mr. Longneck, the blue heron out here, on his nighttime hunting duty. And we weren't so lucky with this one, as they can be pretty deadly as well. Looks like he got a tilapia. But I love the spot of this new camera, so we put one out in Bonnie's Bayou, and that's a real active area for the wildlife that come up and drink out of the pond. <laughs> and you can see this young buck is not sure what to think about the blue heron. Most of the time it's pitch black dark. So they can't see each other that great. And some early morning action from a couple deer. And you can see that moon setting in the background. And a nice buck strolling by. There's a cool shot of the heron taking a break from hunting. You can see the lightning in the background. And we got a bachelor group of bucks treading some water. And some more does moving through to get a last sip of water before they head to sleep. 
and another pesky blue hair in his back during daylight hours. And this one has a unique hunting strategy. He's an older looking bird, and I'm not sure if he's got some eye trouble, but he tilts his head a lot. Maybe that's to help him with a reflection on the water. And another nice buck stopping by at night. So like I mentioned, Bonnie's Bayou is the happening spot for all the wildlife. And another cool shot at night with a full moon in the background. I could watch these clips all day, and there's something special about when you build a pond that attracts all the different variety of species that you've seen over the past years. But I love this new camera angle. You can see here we got two bucks on each side of the bank and a nosy buck that finally caught on to the fact that we added a new camera in this spot. So he's stopping by to investigate it. And this last clip was a rare one. This doe was actually walking through the pond in the middle of the day. Probably just got a little overheated and may have been that mama deer. So in the last video, I had a few people comment that I should get a circular polarizing filter for the drone. What a polarizing filter does is basically take the glare off the water. So it's kind of like polarized sunglasses. It allows you to see deeper down into the water. So I picked up a couple different types. The first one has an individual filter for the three lenses on the drone. And the second one has a single filter for all three lenses. <laughs> and five seconds into the first flight, and I can tell it's absolutely worth getting a polarizing filter for a drone if you're shooting over water. I wish I had a before and after or a side-by-side -side comparison, but me just flying it a bunch, I can already tell you that you can see way better. You can see we got one big school of threadfin shad down there. I'm not sure if I'd have been able to see that without the filter. And I also wanted to check on the spot that the osprey dove down earlier. And if you pay close attention, you'll see a bass swimming right there up under that little algae mat. So that is one lucky bass. And we were also able to film some bluegills spawning. Those little black dots in the center of the white circles are bluegills. And they'll typically start spawning around April. And this is kind of the end of their spawning season. But it looks like we got a bunch of them in there spawning. And there's actually a pair down on the bottom right hand that you'll see spawning together. But bluegills are colonial nesters, so they like to put all their nests together. And that helps them defend off predators like the bass. All right, we're out here at the dove field. And we've been having a lot of fun with these decoys. Last week, we got to see some deer, raccoons, possums, armadillos come up and check them out. But doves have trust and commitment issues, so even though they got a field full of seeds out there, they will not fly in and land unless they see other birds. So that's where this electronic dove comes in. Battery operated, gonna stick him up on top of these T-posts and talk a few more birds to fly in. Also can put some other of the decoys right up there beside him. And I'll have to say, I'm a big fan of these dove decoys. We got them set up and before we could even get out of the field, the doves were flying in, and I'm pretty impressed by the range and how far away you can see these. We're about 400 yards away from the cabin. I'm still able to see those wings flapping. But the doves weren't the only ones fooled by the decoys. Check out this hawk that flew in to attack them. So not only did he pounce on one of the ones on the ground, but he also knocked one off the platform back behind him. <laughs> and you can see here, he's completely confused about what's going on. A couple more doves fooled by him. But the bobcat stopped by and was not fooled at all. And the crows stopping by, probably fighting for territory. They seem to compete with all the birds out here at the farm. And a group of deer stopping by to check them out. They're probably saying, y'all should have already flown up by now. And it never fails, George Jones the possum finds every camera on the farm and makes an appearance. And another spike, can't believe his eyes or nose. And a young deer that seems to be more interested in the camera. But let me know what you think about this, guys. I'm thinking it could potentially be a hummingbird. And if so, that'll be the first hummingbird we've seen out here on the farm. But I'm not 100% sure with this angle. So now it's time for the next adventure, and that is bailing some hay for the cattle. So we planted about 60 acres in a 10 seed variety mix that was mostly made up of seed producing plants like brown top millet and sorghum. And we're gonna bale all the hay to feed the cattle 
and that'll leave millions of seeds down on the ground to help feed the birds and other wildlife. But here's an up-close look at the process. You see the green vehicle driving around is the baler. And my favorite part, whenever it completes a bale and drops it out, not sure why, but there's something satisfying about that. And I think they said we were getting around four bales to an acre, which is probably pretty good because we've been in a drought. And here's the last part of the process, and that's the cutter that basically cuts the hay down, puts it in this nice row for the baler to follow up behind it and scoop it all up. And those white birds you see are flying in to eat the insects. And the doves and all the other seed-eating birds will be in later as the sun starts going down. But that was a quick view of the hay bellum process at the Crimson Oak Farm. So if you watched our last video, we installed two cameras on the Eagle Tower nest. One of them up at the very top that's going to be like a nest view and another dome down below it to give us a good view of the entire farm. But I think the nest view camera turned out perfect and I love this view because you can even see the pond back there in the background. But I'm kind of torn and want to see what you guys think I should do. So I could actually hand build a nest and move it up here on top of the platform and I have a good feeling that something would nest in it, most likely the owls, but I've heard that bald eagles like to build their own nest and I'm not sure that they would use a nest that I built. So do you guys think I should leave the platform as it is and hope that the eagles come in? Or should I just go ahead and build a nest, move it up there, with a lot better chances of us seeing some nesting birds in it later this fall? So just let me know what you guys think I ought to do in a comment down below. So if you thought the bass were aggressive when the bluegill feeders went off, wait till you see some of the nighttime footage. There's a whole nother level of aggression that comes after the sun goes down. So while we watch some of these nighttime shots, I want to talk about an opportunity I've got coming up that could interest some of you guys. So as most of you know, we're building an aquascape pond out here at the farm in November. And this particular pond build is going to be one of the aquascape regional events. And during these events, Aquascape invites new contractors that are interested in becoming certified Aquascape pond builders. And this event is a good time for those new contractors to come in and see how Aquascape ponds are built and can kind of even join in and learn some of the tricks of the trade. So if you live in the southeast and you have like a landscape business or anything of that nature, and have any interest in building aquascape ponds, I've put an email down in the video description and you can reach out to a guy named Geo that works with aquascape and talk about potentially coming out here to our pond build. And basically there's gonna be two parts to this pond build. There's gonna be a small handful of contractors come in in late October and we'll do the initial steps of the pond build. We'll get everything excavated out and basically all the prep work done so that in November when the main pond build happens, all of the new contractors can join in and see the key features to building these ponds, like how to add the liner, set the stones, create the waterfall features, as well as the pumps, lights, and pretty much everything that goes into a pond build. So it's an excellent opportunity for those of you that are looking at getting into the pond building business. And I wish we could open everything up to the public, but unfortunately we can't for this event. Maybe one of the pond builds I have in the future will have a subscriber day where everybody can come out. I think that'd be a lot of fun. All right, time to catch a few more of these bass. Every time we catch one, we're gonna scan them to see if we've tagged them in the past. If we hadn't, we'll use this pit tag injector and inject a fresh new tag in them. You know me, I love frog fishing, so we're gonna start off with that. Eater. Another one that's been caught. 570601. 14 inches long. And this fish weighs 1.49 pounds. And this fish is named Quasimodo. It's the second time we caught him. The first time was back in the spring. And he's gained about a quarter of a pound since then. No major growth, but he is making progress. That scared me. I'm not expecting that one right here at the bank. He did it two times in a row. <laughs> That's an aggressive one. All right, he's been tagged. Five, seven, one, 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 one. 14 inches long, and this fish weighs 1.32 pounds. And this fish is named Xerxes. It's also the second time we caught him. He was too small to weigh back in May. 
So he's putting on some good weight. And the interesting thing is we caught him on the opposite side of the pond last time. So he's a swimmer. Best spot on the lake right there. <laughs> We're throwing. Produces every time you fish it. So run and run in here at me. Good one. Here's a nice fish. Man, this is a big bass to have not been caught. 14 inches. All right, this fish weighs 1.56 pounds. Got him. <laughs> All right, he has not been tagged. <laughs> They're stacked in there around the Oak Throne. This one went airborne. All right, this fish has been caught before, 570134. And this fish is named Wooly Booger. We caught him last month, put on a little bit of weight since then, and the topwater frog gets him every time. And we also had a couple of guests out at the Crimson Oak Pond this past weekend doing a little fishing. So let's see who they caught. Uh, Paul Archer from California, part of the Blue Angels, first cast. Crimson Oaks, baby, let's go. Nice. Hey. 570799. Woo, that's what I'm talking about. Nice one. There we go. That's a nice one. Nate makes with another nice chunky one. Yes, sir. He has not been tagged. We're going to tag him real quick. All right, Nate's is 570948. Now let's check in on some of the newest additions out here at the Crimson Oak Farm. And the first one is this little spotted fawn that's become quite a regular. We see him pretty much every day or every other day. And one day I was heading out of the farm and I saw him. I think that he probably got spooked by some of the wind and ran off from Mama Doe. You can tell he's looking around for her right here, but this is their common area where they walk through. So the little guy's looking around for Mama. I'm sure she's somewhere nearby. You can see later on that night he found Mama. So life is good for the little one. And another shot that I thought was interesting, one of the bobcats had twins. Not sure how common or rare that is. <laughs> and the raccoon getting a close-up look at George Jones. And the wily Cody stopping by to pee on everything. And the raccoon standing up on the back legs looking for food. <laughs> and I think this is his way of trying to notify me. Saying, hey, it's time to put more food out. And the daily turf wars between the ducks and the crows. There's a good daytime shot of one of the coyotes. And it's so hot in Alabama that even the predator birds have to take cover during the heat of the day. That's something you don't see that often. But with all this heat, we've had to pretty much keep the wells running about every other day because we hadn't been getting much rain. And here's a look at those birds. You can see how much they loved all the seeds right before we cut this hay. There's a good look at one of those hay bales. Millions of seeds on the ground. We got the millet and then this other seed variety as well as the fresh peanuts. So plenty of food out here for the wildlife. Now it's time to do our weekly feeding out here at the backyard pond. And every week or two, we get a shipment from Anderson Fish Farm. We love using them because they ship them overnight and always have really good survival rates. And each time we get a shipment in, we acclimate them in the backyard pond for about 20 minutes to let all these golden shiners get acclimated. And that usually works out perfect. But as you can see, that triggers the fish and they know it's about to be feeding time. Moby starts flexing his jaws. And sometimes they get a little impatient. Moby's saying he's ready to eat. And even the turtles start getting aggressive and chasing each other around. And Moby's getting mad because he doesn't like having to wait for his meal. So the past couple of feedings, we've been trying to get some good underwater footage. But there's so much commotion that goes in in the pond and swimming and chasing each other around that they've been dirtying up the water. So whenever it actually comes time to feed them, the video quality is pretty terrible. So I'll be working on a way to get you some good shots here soon. But another reason we're having to get a thousand golden shiners every week 
is because we've got some big bullfrogs out at the pond. I'm never able to film them because they typically come out at night. But I finally caught up to one of these guys and they are chunky. And this one isn't even the biggest. There's one of them out here that may set a record for the heaviest bullfrog. And speaking of aggressive bass, Tiger, the bass that we put in our 300 gallon aquarium, he's getting really aggressive. We were cleaning out his tank the other day and had a net down in the water just scooping some of the particles out. And he knows that whenever he sees that black net, it's supposed to be feeding time. So time to feed Mr. Tiger. But I can tell that as soon as we put him in this 300 gallon aquarium, he started growing at a lot faster rate. We're also able to feed him a little bit more. And now I'm starting to debate what to do with Tiger. I don't want to keep him in an aquarium his whole life. I could potentially put him in the new aquascape pond that we're building in November. Or I could release him back into the 5 acre pond. If you guys have a preference, leave it in a comment down below. Alright folks, that is going to wrap up this video. Make sure to hit that subscribe button to follow along with all the pond builds, aggressive bass, and wildlife out here at the farm. Hope y'all enjoyed this one, and we will see you all next time.